All right, we want to welcome everyone again to the Holy Cross Institute webinar series. Uh, gosh, we've been doing this series now for just about two years, and uh, it's really just been a tremendous way to be able to share the good news of of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great way for us to share amongst the family of Holy Cross and with Catholic educators and leaders really across the globe. And so a uh, great honor tonight to have you with us. Uh, this was a short turnaround from uh, previous uh, uh, commitments that we had. Those of you that made the trip to Austin, Texas two weeks ago for the convocation, we thank you. Uh, all of those keynote presentations are on the Holy Cross Institute um, uh, website uh, uh, on the Holy Cross Institute YouTube channel. So we invite you to go to the YouTube channel to be able to view if you were not able to attend or if you wanted to refer to any of those, uh, they are right there. And so we welcome you tonight for this very special program that features Father Kevin Sandberg coming to us from the University of Notre Dame. Um, and we thank you for taking time for being with us. So um, AJ, let's go ahead and get started. So once again, those of you that might be new to the Holy Cross Institute, um, it, it is a unique partnership between the Moreau and Midwest provinces of the Brothers uh, of the Congregation of Holy Cross here in the U.S. and the host, St. Edwards University, here in beautiful Austin, Texas. And so um, we're delighted to be really the resource center, and we see ourselves as the global resource center for all of the Holy Cross educational ministries around the world. Um, developing and providing information, so resources, conducting research, running webinars like these, putting on conferences, convocation that we just came off of, workshops, as well, there's opportunities for formation. We're involved in uh, mission assessment and leadership development, executive coaching, and conducting retreats. And then ultimately, the real power of this, 120 Holy Cross schools around the world, teaching 110,000 students each and every day, we know that we can fulfill the vision that our founder, Blessed Father Moreau, had to move, change, and sanctify the whole world. Um, those of you that are not currently following us, we are very active on social media, as you can see on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. As well, we also have a LinkedIn page, and we are delighted that the first ever app uh, that's come out of St. Edward University and come out of the Holy Cross Institute is now available for free on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. And that's a daily reflection. Um, I, uh, it's, a, it's a quote or a verse, a writing from our founder, Blessed Father Moreau, uh, with a reflection opportunity. So we thank Brother Joel Gialanza, who is the author of Gravitating Towards God. That, that was the source that was used for this daily reflection. And then as well, we thank uh, other St. Edwards University professors, Kim Garza, James Puglisi, uh, who were involved in the development of that app, and then as well, A.J. Valverde, uh, who helped to get this delivered and, uh, and, and accessible on uh, the Google and Apple app stores. As I mentioned, those 120 schools, colleges, and universities, you can see them depicted here in the United States, where we're fortunate to have 28 schools and eight colleges and universities that are all part of the larger family of Holy Cross and then in 21 countries around the world, serving 110,000 students every single day. Next slide. As we begin this evening, um, we will begin in prayer as we do all things. And this is a prayer that we prepared at the beginning of the year, prepared by my colleague, the Assistant Director of the Holy Cross Institute, Meg Sturgeon. And in a special way, we're gonna ask for the intentions for Sister Sue Ellen Tennyson, who Megs will talk about briefly. So Megs, if you could uh, get us started with prayer. Thank you so much, Marco. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, following the example of your Son, you have called us to participate in building your kingdom of justice, love, and peace. As we endeavor to do this work, we ask you to send forth your Spirit, our great helper, to infuse us with heavenly virtues. Instill in us, we pray, an abiding respect for human life and dignity, a firm resolve to serve our communities, a keen awareness of our responsibilities toward our neighbors, an unyielding commitment to the poor and vulnerable, a high regard for workers and the dignity of their labor, a deep-seated solidarity with the suffering and oppressed, and a benevolent spirit of stewardship over your creation. Rescue us, we pray, 
from the injustices we suffer and the injustices we inflict, so that as one human family, we may attain to the freedom and flourishing for which you have created us. Grant us, Father, the competence to see these injustices and the courage to act against them. This mission is yours, and so is the strength to accomplish it. Be with us then as we strive to be virtuous citizens of this present world, and as we train to become saintly citizens of your heavenly kingdom. We thank you in a special way for the gift of our speaker this evening. We ask your blessing upon him, grant him the gifts of wisdom, eloquence, and conviction that he may inspire us to action on your behalf. Grant us, their listeners, eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, we, in a special way, ask that you would send your protection upon Sister Sue Ellen Tennyson. Uh, as we know, uh, Sister Sue Ellen is a Marianite sister working in Burkina Faso, uh, who was kidnapped this past week. Lord, we ask that you would bless her, protect her, keep her safe and free from all harm, and grant her, her a quick return to her community. We pray that you would give strength and comfort to her Mary Knight sisters, and we ask for your comforting presence in this difficult time. We ask this and all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Megs, thank you. And um, Megs wrote that prayer at the beginning of this school year, where we knew that the focus would be on the principles of Catholic social teaching. And so through the prayer, we like to teach as well as pray um, uh, to be able to send that message, the important messages uh, through that, the founding principles, those uh, the primary principles of Catholic social teaching and our mission as Holy Cross. And thank you, Megs, as well, for the special prayer for Sister Sue Ellen and the Marianite sisters. Um, the Marianite sisters have been a light for the world for 200 years, and uh, we pray that that light may reflect back on them um, during this time of need and that we do um, see a safe return of Sister Sue Ellen very, very soon. At tonight's uh, program, we do not have a sponsor for, but we again invite you to, uh, to help with uh, supporting the activities and the events of the Holy Cross Institute. We aspire to do all that we do and provide it free of charge to all of our participants. So any support that can be provided is always appreciated. There are ways to do so through our website uh, online, or if you have any questions or would like to be a future sponsor, then you can contact me directly. So we thank you. Next slide. And uh, next up is our special guest. Let me introduce you for a moment to Father Kevin Sandberg. Father Sandberg is an assistant teaching professor at the University of Notre Dame, where his work is situated at the intersection of religion and education. That includes his role as a program advisor to Notre Dame's Encore Education Program, the Inspired Leadership Initiative, which is a program for accomplished individuals who have retired from their chosen careers to discover, discern, and design their next act. He also directs educational discernment initiatives through Notre Dame's Center for University Advising. His current study there is to map the ecosystem of student academic formation. From 2017 to 2020, Father Kevin was the director of the Center for Social Concerns at Notre Dame, where previously he taught courses on the theology of the common good and the theology of discipleship. He's a faculty fellow at Notre Dame's Institute for Educational Initiatives. He's chair of the board of Ave Maria Press, which as we know is a Holy Cross apostolate. He's a board member of the Bethany Land Institute in Uganda and past treasurer and board member of the Religious Education Association, which is an association of professors, practitioners, and researchers in religious education. Father Kevin is an ordained priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross. And so Father Kevin, uh, in this week before uh, Holy Week, uh, leading to this Easter season, we welcome you and uh, we're so grateful that you're with us tonight. We'll turn this over to you. Thanks very much, Marco. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to my office, to my plants. These are not fake, they're orchids. I'm from South Florida, 
They don't stay very long, but I do my best to keep them alive. And welcome to my library and welcome to opening day. So I hold this out so you recognize that today we're celebrating the opening day of baseball. Root for your favorite team. It's the only thing that's fake here. Everything else, the plants are not plastic, they're real. So again, thank you for joining this webinar and thank you, Marco, for that generous introduction and for the invitation to participate in the Holy Cross Institute webinar series. I am standing because I like to teach that way and I wanna be engaged with you, not behind a desk or in front of a computer. So I'm trying to keep myself fixed on the lens, but when I preach in the residence hall where I live, the students sit only on the side. So if you see me veering off to the right or the left, that's an old preaching habit. There's nobody ever in front of me. But I think this should work out well. And AJ is there to fix things if I don't get them right. Megs is there to intercept your chats and put them into questions. So let's have a good engaged conversation here. I was initially inspired to speak about Sabbath as a result of my experience during the pandemic. Mine was not an unfortunate one. I got to take long walks in some natural settings. But I know not everyone experienced value in the pandemic, let alone anything Sabbath-like about it. Teachers in particular, as well as medical personnel, are still on the front lines of the pandemic. And I know I couldn't have endured it the way you all have. So I cherish the witness that you've given to humanity for the service that you've provided to the ill and to the next generation. As I flesh out the concept of Sabbath, I'll touch on its relevance to the pandemic. At this point though, I want to share with you how my growing awareness of Sabbath's potential has enabled me to see a problem that in my view, schools face today. I call that problem the treadmill of success. It's a problem I think institutions of Catholic secondary and higher education are positioned to address if we were to adopt Sabbath as an educational aim. Now I'll get precisely to that point in the body of my talk, but let me set the problem up a little bit more. What's the treadmill of success? Let me put it to you this way. At last, last month's Holy Cross Institute convocation, an attendee shared with me what they'd heard recently from a local resident of Austin who had just completed their masters at St. Edward's University. The Austinite had simply said to the attendee, I went to UT and learned a lot of stuff. I went to St. Edward's and learned to think. Now that's a great uh, rating on Yelp. It was the difference between stuff and thought that really caught my attention. Stuff isn't useless, but if it isn't integrated into life, at best it's a means to an end and at worst it's trivia. The Austinites remarks reminded me of the banking concept of education where information is simply deposited into the student's brain and the student then becomes a receptacle or container for information that's of use to other people in the world. Thought, on the other hand, is indicative of education that releases and elevates the human spirit to its greatest potential and its most noble potential. It is designed to enable the human person and their community to reach their most transcendent callings. It respects faith and reason as different but related modes of inquiry and engaging reality, especially the great mysteries of existence. I began to perceive the treadmill of success two years ago, of which I think this is a further sign, this little anecdote from the convocation. When I led an academic program review here at Notre Dame of our first year experience course, it's basically a two credit, two semester orientation to college life. As I interviewed students, I was surprised at the number who since high school had dropped playing a musical instrument. They were simply burned out with it. And it added to their extracurriculars that got them into college. 
I was surprised that students who couldn't identify what their counselors or teachers had written about them in their letter of recommendation, I challenged them to write a thank you to them. And I was surprised that 50% didn't know, 50% of the students at the end of their first year, uh, at the end of their first semester, didn't know what they wanted to study, what they wanted to major in, or what they wanted to embark on as a career. All of this has said to me that the life of a student has become so complicated that it requires a two credit course spread over two semesters just to orient them to college life. I don't know uh, what your experience has been or was, but I didn't realize college had become that complicated. Now I've worked for the federal government, I've worked at a publicly traded international bank, and I've worked in nonprofits. And I've never had orientation to my workplace extend over the course of nine months. So I think there are some complicating factors in education that I would hope Sabbath and the refrain or the pause or the rest that you might recognize with Sabbath can address. And as I was thinking through this and I began speaking to parents last year about this notion of the treadmill of success. And I said, my goal was to get your kids off the treadmill they were all for it. They said, Father, by all means, get them off the treadmill. Now, what they really meant was they wanted me to reduce their child's stress. They still wanted them to succeed. Then I began to speak to students about it, about getting off the treadmill. And they were ambivalent. After all, all they've ever known is the treadmill. So <clears throat> I did a further assessment and I assigned my students to read a chapter from William Derisovitz's 2014 book, Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of American Elite. The chapter they read was simply called The Students. And there, Derisovitz describes how students driven to succeed lack an awareness of why they should succeed. They've simply been programmed to succeed. Great grades, stellar test scores, honors and internships, you know it. It's all a sign of their own individual manifest destiny. The faster they go, the sooner they claim it. The rest of it calls this compulsive overachievement, the sense that students need to keep running as fast as they can. Well, lo and behold, 16 of my 19 students could completely identify with his description. The other three, interestingly enough, they were international students. So they had come from a different form of education. So it isn't just college students at Notre Dame. It has a lot to do with the American educational system. And truth be told, there is no mediocrity in a Holocaust institution of education, higher or secondary, or primary for that matter. Regardless of their educational background, there was something even more telling amongst my students. When I asked them, where they turn for wisdom, books ranked number 10 out of 10. I wanna repeat that. Books ranked 10 out of 10 in terms of places my students would turn for wisdom. Where would they go first? You can imagine social media, YouTube, the internet, Googling, other online news sources. They didn't even list newspapers, TV and streaming services, music, podcasts, even before books, it was word of mouth. They trusted somebody more than they would trust an author in a book. And even before books, art. I think the art profession must be very happy for that. Isn't it striking that the first seven items on their list are all digital? And what the students didn't realize is that those are all subject to algorithms that are not of their own devising at least willfully. So I wanna hypothesize that there's a difference emerging in my mind and maybe in yours between schoolers and learners. Schoolers are students who have proven that they can garner information and produce results. That's great. Learners, on the other hand, are students interested in to know what information counts and which results to pursue. So, Schoolers desire information. Learners desire wisdom. 
schoolers use the methods of collecting and accumulating information, that's their activity. But the activity that's characteristic of learners is to discover and to synthesize. Schoolers are preoccupied with grades, credit, credentials. Then you'd find that learners are not preoccupied but are driven by meaning, value, and purpose. What's the means that they pursue? Well, students are looking for the answer. Uh, schoolers, excuse me, learners are willing to risk questions. In my syllabus, I have a section called academic engagement. And I say, it's not about getting the answer right or wrong. It's about engaging the conversation. What's the scope of vision for a schooler? Well, in large part, it's to check off a list of requirements. It's a checklist. For the learner, it's a bucket list of dreams and imagination, curiosity. Schoolers expect success. Learners expect failure. They're going to risk it. And the norms by which schoolers operate are the standardized ones. The norms by which learners operate are contextualized, usually in deep traditional practices, religious and educational. So schoolers have an external motivation. There's a goal they want to grab hold of. Learners, I think, have an internal motivation. And they can identify their motivating question. Now, that's a bit of a caricature. And it's actually not the whole of my arguments, not even really substantial to it. It's much more I'd like to propose that we risk producing schoolers rather than learners if we don't adopt Sabbath as an aim of a Catholic education, whether that's secondary or higher education. And that's because without Sabbath, we face becoming the same as our competitors because we face the same market pressures. And Sabbath is one very distinctive part of our tradition that however much it's atrophied, we can return to. And that's what I want to get to now. So in the rest of this webinar, what I'd like to make are three points. The first is that um, there is great potential in Sabbath. We have a need for it. The second is that Sabbath is atrophied. Something has happened to diminish its prospect and its use in our own tradition. And third, I want to make a point about Sabbath's return. I want to note the difference that I think Sabbath can make if we integrate it into our understanding of Catholic education. So hopefully that's good. And AJ has queued up for the first section here, Sabbath's potential. I want to start with a little story. My best year at the seminary, and I entered later after a career in financial services, was my final year. So it took me five years to get it right. That's why the seminary is at least five years long, I think. And I'm very happy that I made it through to the end because of this experience. I was asked in my fifth year, the final year before be ordained, to work in campus ministry and the right of Christian initiation of adults. I was also asked to MC the full choir mass, a big mass at the Basilica. So my whole Sunday morning was taken up in ministry. I rushed home to the seminary, had lunch, and then I drove a half hour away to a botanical garden, hence this image. And I spent as much time as I could there before I rushed back to the seminary for five o'clock when we had evening prayer, and then we had a social, and then we had dinner, and then it was seven o'clock, and I didn't want to do any work. It's the best Sunday, the best Sabbath time I've ever had in my entire life. Now, <clears throat> ever since then, I've had a thing for trees. So I'm going to show you something that I have made to keep me focused on that. But for the time being, I want to say that Wendell Berry has a wonderful book of poems called Sabbaths. And I barely got past the first poem, let alone its first line, because the very first line is, I go among trees and sit still. And for me, it became a foundation of 
my Sabbath principle. And actually to go among trees and sit still is in my blood. My mother was a florist. And here on campus, there's a tree that is planted dedicated to her. And to that tree I go when I need to untie the knots, unwind, or in the middle of a day, have Sabbath. So I would even say too, when I wanna pitch it in and I wanna switch jobs, I dream of working at a nursery. Now I know that's not practical, but instead I wrote a life card and AJ will show you what I ended up writing in the next slide. A life card is a rules for life card. It's a statement of personal convictions designed to guide discernment, especially the emotional energy that is created when we get sucked into the vortex of time, pressure, anxiety, and stress. It's intended to express not the what of your goals, but how you go about the journey to your goals and the ways you live out your goal. It's both what to remember and how to remember. So you can see here, and I've modified mine over time as I thought it through, I have four rules. I go among trees and sit still. There I remember or recall my roots. I recall your roots. And then I dare to dream as I look up into the branches of the tree and beyond into the sky. And my dare in dreaming is to teach. In particular, I understand a Holy Cross pedagogy of education to be to kindle the heart, to illumine the mind, and to guide the journey. With that in mind, I want to unpack what is Sabbath? And then I'll go on to why it seems to have atrophied and then how we can return to it. Sabbath has a spiritual function and a social function. You know it from the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. That's in Exodus 20. I think one of the best teachings about Sabbath, however, comes from Abraham Heschel, the 20th century American rabbi, known for his social justice work and civil rights movement in particular. But he argues that the first and foremost, <clears throat> that first and foremost Sabbath has a temporal quality and is a temporal sign offered to creation by God. And it's a sign that the divine self lives to gain the love of the world. Sabbath is a time set aside for lovers, us and God. Why is that sign in the form of time? Because humans have tried forever to conquer space, but they will never be able to conquer time. In Heschel's words, they are the means by which we, that is Sabbath, is the means by which we turn from the results of creation to the mystery of creation, from the world of creation to the creation of the world. We repeat that. Sabbath is the means by which we turn from the results of creation, looking at the garden, to the mystery of creation, that it was created. From the world of creation, our creativity and our productivity, to the creation of the world. So just so you might go back later and look at this, go back to Genesis 2, where you'll read on the seventh day, God completed the work he had been doing. He rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work he had done in creation. Well, in Jewish poetry, this double, this doublet here, you see that seventh day popping up all the time. You realize that Sabbath isn't an interlude between weekend, Saturday and weekday, Monday. It's not an interlude to rest and recuperate, it's the climax of living. And in fact, for God, what it means the Sabbath is the delight. God has no need for a rest. The purpose of God resting is delight. So that's our first clue. Sabbath's spiritual function is to delight. And if we don't take Sabbath, I think we go through life forgetting that our primary programming is to delight in all that God has given us and in each other. Sabbath also has a social function, and it's related to 
the Ten Commandments in particular or its position in them. The Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann describes how the Sabbath commandment was situated as the fourth commandment so that it was a pivot point between the first three that are focused directly on our relationship with God and the last six that are focused on our relationship with one another. In fact, what the Sabbath allows us to do is to pivot from our exchange, our direct experience with God to our exchange, our direct experience with our fellow human beings and all of creation. And to say, God delights in me, I am to delight in what has been given here. And so as we uh, turn our focus from God in the first three to the affairs of commerce, governance, otherwise the rest of our week, as well as in the other commandments, we learn that we're pivoting and we can't pivot if we don't occupy not the space, but the time that holds it all together. The time known as the Sabbath that holds our love of God and our love of neighbor together. So there's a really important social function to Sabbath as well as a spiritual function. It's not just ordered to rest and worship, but to the revelation of a new social reality that God is bringing about by loving us that we might love all of creation. So remember, that's what the fourth commandment says. It's the only commandment that says, remember in that way. But why does God rest? God rests to take delight. To take delight is the Sabbath's potential. Sadly, nobody wants the delight, or we have become surfite in delighting that we ignore the deeper delighting that God has given us the ability for. So now AJ will switch to the next slide and I wanna talk about Sabbath's atrophy. Now I probably have a very curious image there for you. But why I say Sabbath's atrophy is because I'm using this notion of how muscles atrophy. Did you realize that they atrophy at twice the rate that you gain them? So it strikes me that for Sabbath to have disappeared, it has been in disuse for quite some time. For us to reclaim it, it will take quite some time to regain it. But I use this image because I wanna to point to the technocratic paradigm that Pope Francis speaks to as one of the things that has caused the muscle of Sabbath to atrophy in our lives, even in our religious practices. You can imagine that Sabbath has atrophied due to religious indifference to consumer culture. Many might remember that there were blue laws. Even in Indiana, we no longer have a blue law. But it's the technocratic paradigm that I want to point. I'm giving you an image from The Mandalorian, which is a Disney streaming series that has been spun off from Star Wars. The Mandalorian is a bounty hunter. Here you see him positioned right next to IG-11, a droid who was also a bounty hunter, commissioned to get and otherwise kill the asset that is now known as Grogu or was initially called Baby Yoda when the series went streaming in 2019. Why I point to this is because the series embodies this notion of the technocratic paradigm and are healing from it. And I'm pointing to the technocratic paradigm because I think schoolers are participating in it. And what happens in The Mandalorian is in this very first episode where I've captured this scene, the droid, which The Mandalorian hates droids, the droid wants to kill baby Yoda, Grogu. The Mandalorian prevents him from doing so and in fact, he shoots the droid in the head. In the very last episode of that first season of The Mandalorian, the roles are reversed. The droid has been reprogrammed to become a nurse droid, not a hunter droid. And it saves The Mandalorian's life. And I would argue I'm teaching a class on the theology of the Mandalorian. That's why this has come up right now. But I would argue that what the Mandalorian is exploring 
is how we reverse the technocratic paradigm that has put us into a droid programming mentality. And the more we are subject to algorithms on those digital media, the first seven things that my students listed as their source of wisdom, the more we remain in that droid mode because somebody has programmed us. But even if a droid can be reprogrammed to be a nurse droid, then there's hope yet for us as well as for the Mandalorian. Let me just say a little bit about that technocratic paradigm. It comes from Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. And what he's arguing there is that we will not be able to fix the problems of the world through the same mindset that has caused them. And the mindset that has caused them is the notion that everything is a means and there is no end that justifies the means. By which I would say every end is taken to justify the means. And so means are at will. There is an interesting parallel for this in the work of the British psychiatrist, Ian McGilchrist. And he's written a book called The Master and His Emissary that looks at the nature of the right brain and the left brain. And he argues that our Western mode of reasoning has become increasingly autonomous and it rules how our brain has come to function and shapes the way our culture works. So ordinarily, you might know that popular psychology has bifurcated the brain between the left side as linear, mathematical, logical, and the right side as holistic, intuitive, visual processor, artistic. But McGilchrist's study has argued that this depiction isn't the best way of understanding it. He says that there's an analytical functionality that tends to operate independent of the contextualizing functionality of the brain. So you can imagine the left brain is analytical and it's been sent out by the right brain, the master, to get data. Well, because it's become so technocratic, the left brain has recognized that it doesn't have to bring the data back, put it into context and figure out what to do with it. This is a little bit of way of understanding that difference between the schooler and the learner. And you see it not just in the brain's composition, but how the brain has manifest itself in culture. So one other aspect of this techni technocracy and the technocratic paradigm, it's actually more invasive than we realize. And it's how we end up with a misconception of time. That misconception of time in particular that I have in mind is what I would call the tyranny of billable hours. And students participate in it insofar as they are racking up credit hour after credit hour, and they're chasing prerequisite after prerequisite, internship after internship to get ahead, to grab the success. This is the treadmill that they're on. But the theologian and law, law school professor, Kathy Caveney at Boston College has described the life of lawyers who live under billable hours. And she has said that lawyers who work under such a regime run the great risk of seeing the world through the lens of, its, of time's instrumental value. And that's what billable hours subjects them to. So what lawyers end up doing is commodifying all their time. Family time at Thanksgiving takes away from billable hours. It's possible to balance them, but you have to work very hard at it. You have to remain, in my language here, a learner or become a learner as much as you were taught to be a schooler. So, you know, these incessant demands for increased productivity that a schooler is responding to go back millennia. All you have to do is think of Pharaoh, the taskmaster with the Hebrew slaves, and you will begin to realize that your local Starbucks or your Amazon delivery agent is also transmitting data back to corporate headquarters about remaining productive, about hitting the goals being on the treadmill of success. So those demands for increased productivity tend to foster a linear logic in which external actors such as religion no longer have a voice that's sufficiently powerful to counterbalance what I described as the emissary's presumed autonomy, the left brain. So one of the things that we have to recognize is that the problem is manifested in all sorts of different ways. 
Billable hours don't strike me as anything different than teaching to the test when it comes to a teacher's experience. I know how regrettable those experiences can be for people. Just to conclude this section, where did the Sabbath go? It succumbed to billable hours. It succumbed to the technical paradigm. It succumbs every day to the algorithm that we participate in the more we are online. And I don't mean to demean being online, but at the mercy of somebody else who's taking our output and feeding us back to us as input that we desire. But there's hope. As I said, IG-11 gets reprogrammed to be a nurse droid. He saves the Mandalorian. If the Mandalorian can be saved, so can we. So now we'll go to the next slide, because what I want you to see here is that there is a way of understanding the way, the, excuse me, the difference between schoolers and learners in a very, very concise way. We're gonna pass by this so we can get into this final section, go to the next slide, please, AJ. And I wanna talk briefly about the Sabbath's return. So <clears throat> I had a conversation recently with one of our elder priests who is retired from teaching in the program of great books here at Notre Dame. And he said to me, as I was talking to him about this webinar to come, he said, well, this is what students want. They want you to pitch the ball to them so they can hit it back to you. Students want the teacher to pitch the ball to them so they can hit it back to you. What I wanna propose is that the Sabbath provides education a better metaphor than baseball, even though today's opening day. I don't mean to malign it, go Cubs. No, what the Sabbath provides education and Catholic education in particular is the vehicle to teach this to all education. What the Sabbath provides education is a culture of metamorphosis. Why do I say metamorphosis? Many people think about education as transformative. Yes, education is informative, education is formative, and education is transformative. But what I wanna propose is that Catholic education is uniquely positioned to be understood as a metamorphosis. Why metamorphosis? Well, because what happens is I don't wanna give my students a pitch of a baseball for them to hit it back to me. And what I figured out is I need to show them that they're a caterpillar and I need to put them in the cocoon so that the chrysalis becomes the butterfly. Now that might be too quaint of an image. It seems like it might be a poster hang 10 kitty for you there. But to be honest with you, there's something very powerful about this notion of treating a student as a chrysalis. In fact, what happens with the chrysalis, if you can remember, and one of the reasons why I like this idea is that no student forgets this after the age of five or nine, whenever it is that they're introduced to a butterfly garden, because what happens to the chrysalis is that it basically dissolves and it rebuilds itself based on very particular data that's embedded in it to become the butterfly. And I think that the notion of metamorphosis captures the imagination and the creativity that we have worked hard to put into children at a very young age, I shouldn't say put into, but oftentimes we educate out of them, at least according to Ken Robinson, that we educate out of them that imagination and that creativity. I also think that the metamorphosis works very well with this notion of algorithms and being programmed. What it says to me is that human beings are programmed to be reprogrammed. And the way we interrupt the algorithm outside and activate the program to be reprogrammed within us is to Sabbath. It is to take Sabbath. So I think that there's some precedents for doing this. And the one I wanna mention here briefly is an old one, but you may have read it yourself. And it's the philosopher Joseph Pieper and his essay, 
leisure, the basis of culture, which he wrote in Germany and delivered as a speech in 1947, when he was considering what was necessary to guide Germany's post-war rebuilding effort. I've turned to it because I think we need a Sabbath to guide our post-pandemic rebuilding effort. And I think education is the place to start. Now, you might find that an interesting piece of language, leisure, the basis of culture. And why am I going to that instead of culture? But Pieper determined that leisure should be the cornerstone of culture redevelopment, since historically it was the basis of Western culture. But the leisure that he's talking about isn't rest and relaxation and going down to Cabo. The leisure was connected to worship or the cultus. And in particular, it is the language that would be in the Greek for schooling. And so Heber was basically saying education is the basis of culture. And I could push it further and say Pieper was saying that Sabbath was the basis of culture. Because in the epigraph to his volume, he cites, I'm blanking on it, Psalm 91 or 96, 96 I think it is, and it says, be still and know that I am God. But you can translate that Hebrew to say Sabbath and know that I am God. And if we don't Sabbath, we will not know God. And if we do not know God, looking at the first three commandments, we won't be able to do effectively what God has asked us to do, which is to look in the other direction, pivoting from that fourth commandment and looking at our brothers and sisters and loving our neighbors as much as we love God, as much as we have received love from God. So Pieper describes leisure, and here's where you can think about Sabbath, as a receptive attitude of mind, a contemplative attitude, not only the occasion, but also the capacity for steeping oneself in the whole of creation. That's one of the reasons why I put that opening picture of the sunset out there, or the sunrise in the forest. That's why I think it's important to go amongst trees and sit still. It's also why I think it's important to walk around lakes and to see the swans as they build nests and as they bring forth their signets. And here's why I have this picture. Now, I wanna touch briefly on a very Holy Cross particular aspect about this, and that is the work of Father John Dunn, who taught theology here at Notre Dame for 55 years. Because to rebuild what we need is something or someone to kindle the heart in a world grown chill. And that's what happens to the Mandalorian. He's a heart encased in steel that's impenetrable. In fact, what transforms him is a droid that has been reprogrammed to be a nurse droid. That expression, kindle the heart in a world grown chill comes from J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And it was a favorite of Father John Donne's readings. He would read it every third year, reread the whole trilogy. And it alludes to a ring that is given to um, Gandalf. Sorry, his name escaped me immediately. And it was given to him because it was known that at times the world grows chill and so does the heart. Now, how do you reboot the heart? I do think the Sabbath is a way of doing that. And I've turned to Father John Donne because his educational charism followed the principle that the exhausted life is renewed in the heart. I think there's a really strong connection between the Sabbath and the heart. The Sabbath is what reactivates the heart. It is like the paddles that resuscitate the being, not because we needed the rest and the recuperation. It resuscitates our mind to remember what we have received from God so that we can then give to all of humanity and creation what love we have received. Let me just bring one thing forward from Father John Dunn's work that's really instructive for us. And then one final note, it's this. 
Over the course of his 55 years of teaching theology here, Father John Dunn saw, and he began in the 50s, that at first students in the 50s were hesitant to ask questions. And that makes perfect sense. All he heard were the rote answers that they had been trained by manual theology to reiterate. By the 1960s, students asked a lot of questions. They were in fact undisciplined in the way they asked questions. You can imagine that is characteristic of that era. By the 1970s, students asked, he said, vocational questions. They were concerned to be happy and they feared they would not be. My friends, amongst Notre Dame undergraduates, first year to senior students, you know what their biggest fear is? Not even about not being happy, it's about being alone. Their greatest fear is loneliness. And the Sabbath is actually at the root of it because they don't take Sabbath, they don't have a connection strong enough to God to get them through the loneliness and the connection that receives the love and then demonstrates it, offers it to others, oftentimes in sacrificial ways. Sure, they wanna give back, they wanna serve, but that's oftentimes initially out of a surfite. So one of the things I think we need to do is to prevent our students from fleeing the void within, which is going to social media. John Dunn said that was a flight before social media came about that was triggered by desperation. I think the more we introduce practices of Sabbath into our world, into our educational set set settings and system, the more we'll be able to heal people of that desperation of that loneliness, of that fear. Here's the thing, we have had an opportunity to learn this from the ground up through the pandemic. As I said earlier, not everyone had a good experience in it. People are still dying from it, in fact. It doesn't prevent us from recognizing what's been called the anthropause, the phenomenon of decreased human impact on the natural world. By virtue of it, the natural world had a Sabbath from human interference. In fact, a jubilee, because the lack of human interference will have such consequences generation after generation after generation. You might remember the images, though they could fade quickly. Quiet in cities around the world became open zoos. Gorillas had twice the number of babies and more cheetah cubs survived. Ocean beach closures in my native Florida led to a 40% increase in nesting success for loggerhead turtles. These things will pay off for generations. And Sabbath will pay off for generations of Catholic education if we pursue it too. This is what I need you to do. You have to imagine that you're on an airplane as we're all traveling again. And the flight attendant is giving us the instruction that in the event of an emergency, you have to put your mask on first. If you don't practice Sabbath, your students won't. And it can be as simple as this. My spiritual director from my retreat house was a Jesuit in Asia most of his life, practicing meditation and contemplation from Nepal to Japan. Came back to his final assignment, which was at University of Detroit Mercy High School and learned that they were having the bell ring and here you go, all of a sudden, everyone stopped and dropped, dropped for three minutes. So he was skeptical of this because he's been doing meditation where you do it for three hours, not three minutes. So he asked two football players about it one day. He said, they said, oh, Father, it's the only time we get to think and rest all day long. They've been on a treadmill. We all have been. Even the pandemic has been a bit of a treadmill. But the most important thing for us to recognize is that there is a way off of it. And the Sabbath not only tells us to get off of it, but gives us a vehicle to get off of the Sabbath. Thank you so much for your attention today. I would challenge you to create your own rules of life card. And I put the model up that I was given by my friend. This is from Pierre Merkel who ran the world's largest Woolworth, the world's largest Woolworth in Boston in the 60s and the 70s. And this is how he lived. 
take out a pen and a piece of paper and write your own life card tonight so that you have a means to codify what it means to step back, to take Sabbath, and to allow then the love of God that we receive to be communicated in the love of neighbor. That's the difference, I think, that Catholic schools have always made. But we're increasingly programmed by an algorithm that is out of our control. But we can be reprogrammed. And Sabbath is the great button to hit that says reprogram. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, um, fantastic. I cannot thank you enough. I, I've had the great pleasure of um, sitting in the church pews watching you preach, um, sitting side by side with you at coffee shops, whether here in Austin or there at Notre Dame. Um, and I captivated by your every word and the depth of your thoughts. And, uh, and I furiously take notes on everything that you say. And so I'm so glad that tonight this is recorded because these insights that you've shared, um, I know will resonate with so many of our uh, school, our teachers, our school leaders, our, our board members. Um, and I think that, you know, I even think about what Moreau said, right? Moreau, uh, the early brothers of St. Joseph and Desjardins, and then Moreau and the brothers and sisters as they went out into these towns and villages. Of course, Moreau said, yeah, teach those students everything that they should know. But then he went on to say, but the mind must not be cultivated at the expense of the heart. And yes. we all know that quote as probably the most prominent one, the most used one from Moreau. But I don't know that we necessarily give enough thought to what that really means, right? The real emphasis on the education of the heart, right? For healing, for life, um, and for values, certainly. I think we still see it in teacher mode, right? I'm gonna teach that heart how to, uh, uh, how to live. but we've never talked about this moment, about the value of solitude, about the value of Sabbath, right? Um, self-reflection, right? We don't raise a generation of self-reflection. And so, you know, we probably see this much more in Western cultures. And we do have a question that, uh, that I want to ask of you and right. would invite anybody else that has any questions. But, you know, at, at, you mentioned early on that uh, places like Notre Dame, certainly at our Holy Cross schools, colleges and universities, you know, we're proud of our academic rigor and, and we're proud of the product that comes out of our schools, right? Um, how do we best strike a balance between maintaining rigor and promoting Sabbath? It's a great question. And I hope that I don't speak from such a privileged point of view, given all the resources we have here at Notre Dame, that I give too idiosyncratic an answer. But it's this. I actually think that there's much to be said for the monastic form of education that is a preserve from engagement in society. At the same time, I've benefited and worked hard at making sure that students remain engaged. But there's a contemplative mindset that you can instill through any number of practices. You mentioned solitude. And there is no greater shrine in all of Holy Cross than the solitude in Le Mans. And Father Moreau would seek that solitude. And what we have received from him in that contemplative mindset is a monastic element that is threatened to be diminished in even Holy Cross. But oftentimes here at the University of Notre Dame, which has grand quads because it's built on the French model, I compare it to the English model that you would find at say Princeton or at Harvard, which are busy small squares. The French model comes from the monastic experience of being able to take the word and contemplate it and walking around a cloister or a quad, the garden or otherwise. So one of the things that we have to do is actually change the way in which the institutional structure, and I'm talking about the actual physical facility looks to our students because their frame of reference is shaped by the building 
what surrounds it and the ways in which people work about and through it. So there's all sorts of ways people can do that without obviously demolishing the four walls, the floor and the ceiling that can find a classroom or a school building, et cetera. But one of the most important things that we can do is step back and think, what's the image that our students get? My high school, when I grew up in South Florida, was a public high school. It was modeled off of a factory from the early 20th century. And not many schools have changed their shape or the design of their look from that then. So the more we can instill imagery, and, uh, and that's why I use those pictures, right? And metaphors and symbols of the contemplative life, the more we'll be able to succeed at making those two things work. Because my convi I'm convinced, my conviction is that the learner is ultimately the more successful one. So I'll just add here real quickly, I did this experiment with students and I had them redesign the facade of the University of Notre Dame's library, the Hesburgh Library, which people may know is Touchdown Jesus. And I said, well, they're gonna take the mural off. What would you put there? Well, basically what they wanted to put up there was a big iPad with all these apps on it. So there's a way in which solitude can even be created by um, fasting from technology. Now I recognize use of technology in the classroom as well as iPads for Kindle books, et cetera, too. But there has to be a way in which the learner can be cultivated, as you say, Marco, the heart, not at the expense of the mind, but in fact, to make the mind better because that's where the solution to the problems in the world come from. As Pope Francis has said, the technocratic mindset will not solve the problems that the technocratic mindset caused. You know, um, Father, uh, gosh, I want to read something to you. Uh, early in my career as a school administrator, I wrote uh, the welcome opening to our uh, annual graduation ceremony, commencement exercises, and I wrote these words that um, at our school, students have learned the value of productive solitude, mindful reflection, and restful excellence. They've learned that all great reading is an act of reverence that enlarges the soul. They have become architects of their time. They have learned the importance of maintaining an attitude of gratitude, the life-giving mystery of grace, and the virtues of modesty, humility, and authenticity. They've also understood that everything has dignity and pricelessness. They've cultivated the character of their soul and they to live and to live life fully. And, and that to live life fully is to live animated for a cause larger than themselves. That's and some years point. later, and I repeated that every year at commencement, I remember having sort of this crisis of conscience where I said, I'm not sure that's what we're doing anymore. Um, and, and, I, and I thought, well, what can we do to, to come back to these roots? This is what we said was important. This was aspirational for us. It was all part of an exercise we had done many years before. And, um, and part of it was creating those rest, restful spaces, those places of solitude on our campus. I was at a school that was uh, pretty urban centric, uh, very limited uh, campus space. And we found spaces for walking gardens. We created new spaces. And the students initially didn't really know how to handle it or what to do with it, but it was so rewarding some years later to see students just sprawled out in the grass, sitting on a blanket um, in conversation and reflection, enjoying the beauty of nature. So I think it's, I just finished reading a book called Together by uh, the Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. And to your point, he said that our, our country, especially our kids are suffering greatly from loneliness and, and a lack of belongingness. Depression and anxiety is high. Um, yeah. And I remember, of course, what Father Moreau said, the mind must not be cultivated at the expense of the heart. Right now, in this particular time in history, our students need us to focus on the heart, need us to focus on their soul, to provide for places for productive solitude, mindful reflection and restful excellence to cultivate the character of their soul and to teach them how to live a life fully animated for a cause larger than themselves. And so we thank you for you sharing these reflections tonight, Father. And um, 
I, I look forward to broadly sharing tonight's webinar with our community, our, our 1,500 or so followers that we have on our social media channels and through our e-newsletter. I also just want to draw everybody's attention before we close out tonight to a, the next event that is being planned by the Holy Cross Institute. This will be a first, uh, what we believe will be an annual event, and that is to focus on this intersection of belonging and education an inclusive teaching and learning conference for higher educators and for secondary educators and Holy Cross. This is coming up June 23rd and 24th here on the campus of St. Edward's University. It's gonna be offered both virtually and in person. And um, uh, we will be providing on-campus housing to control the costs for people. So you'll be able to make the trip here, stay on campus for 50 bucks a night or so. Um, so there's more information here about it. At the top of the screen, you can email the Holy Cross Institute if you want to learn more. We also have a call for proposals if anybody would like to be a speaker or presenter at that particular event. And then also in June, we'll be gathering student leaders in both the Midwest locations and the uh, Southwest. Um, I, so schools can choose either of these destinations, June 8th through the 12th here on the campus of St. Ed's, and then June 22nd through the 26th. And we'll have more information going out about both of these events. Next slide, AJ. We always invite your feedback on all that we do. The feedback we've received from convocation was really tr tremendous. Uh, and uh, both from a complimentary vantage point and also from a critique. And we appreciate that. So we hope you take the time to uh, provide an evaluation on tonight's um, uh, webinar. And then last slide. I always like to come back to the real work that we do. As Moreau said, that education is a work of resurrection. It's meant to be our liberation from the darkness of ignorance. It's meant to be a vehicle for the transformation of society. And you talked about metamorphosis tonight, Father Kevin. And it's meant to be a process that helps to make all things, especially the persons engaged in it, new. I know I feel renewed tonight following this webinar, and I hope all of you do as well. And as we enter into the holiest week of the year, Holy Week, uh, and conclude Lent and celebrate new beginnings through Easter, we're reminded that we are a resurrection people, and we're reminded that we are disciples with hope to bring. So let's stay that way. May God bless you all. There's a link in the chat there for anybody that wants to get some more information on the Holy Cross Institute. But we thank you. And Father Kevin, we thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Have a great night. Bye-bye, everybody.